The electronic health record is a um, really robust and rich source of data. When we think about drug repurposing, we think about the reasons that we need to repurpose uh, medications in general, these are, these are situations where by definition, our traditional mechanisms for drug development and drug discovery aren't feasible. And that may be because there's not enough time because we have an emerging disease. It may be because the disease is exceedingly rare or there's some ethical reason why we can't conduct a randomized controlled trial. Or it might simply be that there's already a standard of practice that has emerged somewhat organically. We're, when we're able to leverage the real world data out of the EHR, we're able to get a better understanding of what's out there and able to do uh, some types of research with e which either helps us refine and develop a hypothesis that we can test through more uh, traditional, more interventional studies, or help us better understand what's actually being done out in the real world and understand better how are providers actually practicing out there. As we dig through this data, we're then able to either provide some level of evidence to help support that, that current use and help describe that use and provide more support and increase the strength of guidelines, or ultimately, as I said, build those hypotheses to, to test in a formal interventional trial, which might support uh, going forward in a traditional randomized control trial, which could eventually be submitted to the FDA for labeling updates. So when we look about what is the different, the importance of translational science and medicine, we have to think about you know, what do we mean? It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. From my perspective, um, my, my training is in implementation science and what we focus on is the reality that when a discovery is made in a lab through wet bench research, it typically takes about 17 years for that discovery to start imp imp impacting the way that clinical practice is actually delivered. And with translational science, with implementation science, what we're looking at is trying to shorten that time frame so that we go from having a discovery to something that impacts patients' outcomes, impacts the care they receive much, much, much quicker. And so this becomes a really important framework if we want to be able to help patients now, instead of following this really slow, laborious, traditional path, which is sometimes necessary if we need to really refine the intervention and try to get a better understanding of what we're looking at. But there are other times when it's a very clear discovery, when we very clearly understand the benefit that something could have. And even if we have the most robust evidence, we have you know, well-designed randomized control trials, it still may take decades for that information to actually make its way down to the providers. And so we think about traditional translational science we're talking about the, the steps of going from that wet bench, from that preclinical discovery into a phase one, into a phase two, into a phase three. But I think the other piece that we really need to think about is even beyond that, once we have that phase three trial, once we have a really good understanding of the impact and the, the efficacy of those medications, making sure that we have pathways to get that information out to help changing the way, start changing the way providers provide care for their patients in a much faster way. So we're not waiting for the guidelines to get updated. We're not necessarily always waiting for that full formal FDA label announcement, but we're taking advantage of the evidence that's out there to actually change the way providers are caring for their patients in more near real time instead of waiting that 17 years for it to actually start making a difference. From my perspective, real world data is essential. Um, we, when we look at a, at a clinical trial, a randomized controlled trial, we think of it as this gold standard of evidence because we have um, created a situation where we have designed out as much of the bias as we can. The reality is though, in, in designing those trials, we've introduced other forms of bias. We know looking back throughout history that Western medicine has traditionally centered on white, middle-aged, affluent men. So we, if we look at something even as simple as, as heart disease and heart attacks, we have, we have really lost and we don't have a really good understanding of what a heart attack looks like in a woman versus what it looks like in a man because when we design a really, really highly regimented randomized control trial, we end up losing some of the heterogeneity by design because we want to very clearly see the effect of the intervention. But what we also lose is a pop, we, we lose access to a population that actually looks like the patients that we're treating. And so using real world evidence, 
when we look at the effectiveness of an intervention, we're able to look at a much broader patient population. We're able to look at patient populations that look more like the country, more like the population as a whole. And we're able to include people from institutions and regions that wouldn't have access to, to, be, to participate in those randomized control trials, which are typically conducted in large academic medical centers. So that real world evidence not only helps us compare to see how might we have missed the boat on how might the population selection have changed something, but we also get some understanding about how practice actually changes. Because yes, we can know very clearly what happens in a very regimented environment that the patient, we know for sure the patient takes their medication on time every time. Uh, one example of this would be the treatments for hepatitis C. In the randomized controlled trials, we knew how many doses were going to be needed for those medications. But when we look at the real world data, we actually found that they don't need all of the doses for it to actually be efficacious or effective even. But we wouldn't understand that if we stopped at a randomized controlled trial. And there's plenty of other examples where we, we learn something new by looking at what happens in reality because it's no longer in a lab. None of us exist in those sterile environments. We don't consume healthcare in those sterile environments. And so if we don't move on to that phase four and don't look at what's actually happening out in the real world, we lose a, a part of the understanding of what this data needs to look like. And as far as other data sources that we need, there's, there's many. Real world data from the EHR is just one piece of the puzzle. It is a massive and incredible untapped potential but it doesn't let us get at how does the patient feel about these things? How does the patient's quality of life impact it? Are the measures that we're actually implementing as part of our research of some interest to patients themselves? Or have we missed the mark? Is there something else that a patient cares about more than their survival? You know, for a cancer treatment, is the patient much, are patients much more concerned about the side effects from their chemotherapy, the neuropathies they might experience. There's lots of data beyond the EHR that we need to look at. Um, and then I, th I think it really depends on what we mean by a big data source or a good data source. Because there, there are precious few large-scale repositories where we have millions of data points, but there are plenty of other data sources that we need to consider. We need to look at large-scale, uh, robust, and reproducible source of information around patients' perspectives so we can make sure we take those into consideration as we move things forward, whether that's revising our hypotheses for an interventional trial or looking at observational research to, to establish effectiveness. But when we lo look at real-world data from the EHR, we're, we're missing out on a lot of the patient experience and a lot of the patient priorities and expectations around their treatment. And so to be able to, to explore those other, other data sources of data is ex exceedingly important because we, if we only look at one data source, we're always only getting part of the picture and we're naturally biasing ourselves and our findings.